Today is September 12th, 2008. My name is Mark DePew. I'm the Director of Oral History at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. I'm here today, thrilled to be here with Miles Harston. Miles, how are you today? Good, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, we are in Flanagan, Illinois, and we are at your uh, location, which is known as Aqua Ranch. Miles, want you to tell us very quickly what the background is, and then we'll get into the uh, formal part of the interview. Aqua Ranch is uh, a facility that grows fish naturally uh, without the use of uh, chemicals and hormones. And then we also grow produce uh, off the fish water. And uh, we're, nat we're organic certified on the fish, or uh, excuse me, not on the fish, but on the, uh, on the produce. We feed the fish, the fish feed the plants, the plants clean up the water for the fish. And so what we're looking behind you here over your shoulder is some of that produce? That's some of the produce, and these are, they're located in the grow beds, and there's about 10 inches of water underneath each one of these floats. And we're gonna get into that in much more detail later on in the interview. So let's start at the beginning, and uh, hear you explain when and where you were born, a little bit about growing up. Well, I was born in Denver, Colorado. My parents moved around a bit. They moved to uh, Butte, Montana. I don't remember either one of them, but then we moved to Utah. When, what was the birthday though? <coughs> uh, we, Your birthday. My birthday, uh, April 29th, 52. Okay. Um, so you moved around, you said? We moved around a little bit. Uh, then we moved to Utah when I was about two. And at that point, my father uh, embarked with some horses which I enjoyed, and then we also, uh, I, I began to become an aquarium enthusiast as a child. And uh, in the Utah Valley area, that's, those are two things that, I, that took up my childhood, it were horses and, and fish. It was, what was your father's profession? My father was a medical doctor that specialized in psychiatry. And he would do, what he would do is take charge of community mental health centers, and that's one of the reasons he moved to various locations. So he was a psychiatrist who also enjoyed horses? Yes. Well, that's, that's a curious mixture, but maybe he didn't think so. Well, it was kind of a release for him. Uh, and he actually grew up with horses, uh, loved horses, did farm work with horses, and, and uh, had never really wanted to get away from them, so. Did he grow up on the farm? Yes. Uh, did he grow up in, uh, in the Colorado area? He grew up in Wyoming. Uh, northern Wyoming on a, on a farm ranch in northern Wyoming. They grew uh, sugar beets and they grew uh, uh, sheep and cattle. What was your father's name? Marlo Harston. First name again? Marlo. Okay. And a little bit about your mother. My mother was actually born in Canada. And uh, when she was a, uh, uh, a teenager, she moved to... Uh, with her family to Utah, and then eventually she, uh, after high school, she moved to Chicago. And uh, she went to work at m the first Montgomery Ward in Chicago, in downtown Chicago. And that's actually where my mother and father met, was that my dad went to medical school at Northwestern University. Okay, what was your mother's maiden name? Uh, Mab um, her maiden name was Henson, her, she was Mabel Henson. Mabel Henson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and sounds like most of your formative years were spent growing up in Utah. Well, when I was 15, my dad took a job in Kentucky. And uh, so then we picked up and moved to Kentucky. Uh, during those years, I actually, uh, again, enjoyed the horses and worked a lot with the horses, but also uh, managed an aquarium store uh, while I was there. In both locations, then in Utah and in Kentucky, were you actually living on a small ranch with your parents? Uh, in Utah, we just we had property. We didn't. We weren't living on the property where the horses were. Uh, it was another location. But in Kentucky, we had property where we had the horses right there. But what you've described so far suggests that hey, there were some chores that went along with well, growing always, up. Always, always, we always had uh, chores with the horses and. And of course, uh, I enjoyed the cleaning aquariums and working with the aquariums. What kind of chores did you have with the horses? Oh, we had to we had to feed them and water them. And in the in the West, uh, of course, you've got to water's a big thing. Uh, it's scarce, and so you got to make sure there's water. And 
and uh, we had to hay him, and of course we, we, uh, we did a lot of riding in the mountains of the West. Uh, to exercise him, or uh, because that was just plain old fun? It was just fun. We just enjoyed it. Um, and went to uh, public schools in Utah? Yes. And then I went to uh, Kentucky, and I went to high school in Kentucky. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about the religious background of the family. We are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, we're, we are devout uh, members. Uh, we, we work hard to, uh, to uh, follow our Christian values. Um, I did go on a mission for our church when I was uh, 18, 19, and, I'm sorry. And I want to get into that just a little bit sure. later, but sure. spend a little bit more time in your childhood. Uh, brothers and sisters? I have one brother who lives here in Illinois, and I have uh, four sisters. Anything especially memorable to you and uh, that you cherish about those years growing up in uh, Utah and Kentucky? Oh, probably the time I spent with my brother and I riding horses, and we, we spent a lot of time riding horses. When you said you rode into the mountains, um, were you uh, hunting or just enjoying the riding? Just riding, just enjoying the riding. We, didn't, we, did, we did hunt, but we never seemed to hunt with our horses. We, we separated them, and we, uh, we spent most of the time just, just riding our horses. And we had a lot of other friends that, that we got involved in the horses as well, and so it was a lot of fun. So it was, it was a good deal. It was popular to uh, go out and uh, spend some time with the, uh, the family and, and ride the horses in the country, I sure, would think. Sure, absolutely. Okay, any other extracurricular activities? Uh, that was, uh, Tell me more about the aquariums. The aquariums, we, uh, you know, we had aquariums all over the house. Uh, my mother and I enjoyed the aquariums together. Um, in fact, uh, that's part of what stimulated what you see behind me is, as, as my mother would uh, feed or water her uh, plants in the house, she would take water from my aquariums and that's what she would feed the, uh, the plants with, the, with water and they always seemed to just thrive so well and it was just always something that stood in the back of my mind uh, for years is that it just made sense that that aquarium water, if aquarium water is high in nutrients, it ought to be good for plants. Was that her thought? That's why she was using that water? Well, that was probably part of her thought. Another part of her thought was that it, we already had the chlorine out of the water and uh, without having chlorine in water, it, it's just better for plants as well. So. Okay, mm -hmm. and you like the fish side of it, but you also like the, the working with the plants and with the aquariums? Uh, well, yeah, I, d I didn't really get that involved with the plants at an early age. My mother did, but, but uh, uh, I, I re that was something that stayed in the back of my mind really until after we, uh, I didn't get that going until after we started the, uh, the aquaculture on a commercial okay. scale. Uh, in high school then, this was uh, maybe a year or so in Utah, but mostly in Kentucky, what were your thoughts about what you wanted to do with your life afterwards? Oh, I guess I wanted to be a horse trainer at that point and have aquariums as my hobby. And uh, so that was really my thought. And you graduated in what year from high school? Graduated in, uh, in uh, 70 from a uh, little little school at the time called Lone Oak High School. Okay, mm -hmm. and where from there? And uh, I actually went to a community college for a year and then from there I went on a mission to, for, for our church and I went to the Philippines for two years. Two year? Right. I thought most missions were one year missions. Uh, most of them are, are two years. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like to have you tell me a little bit about that experience. First of all, why the Philippines? Well, the way our church works is, is they determine where they need us. And so uh, uh, when I first got my uh, uh, assignment to go to the Philippines, I wasn't even sure where it was. So uh, uh, it was kind of fun to start doing research on, on the Philippines. And, and uh, became a, af after seeing some of the things that went on in the Philippines and the aftermath of, of World War II that still hung on even in the 70s, it uh, kind of made me a history buff. It was quite fascinating to talk with some of the people who had been involved mm -hmm. in World War II and, and some of the things that uh, had happened 
there in the Philippines. Did sure. you get some language training before you went over? Uh, no, I didn't. We, I did pick up um, quite a bit of Tagalog and was nearly fluent by the time I left, although I, I'd have to say I'm pretty rusty now. It's been a while. So the areas of the Philippines that you were working in were where? I, I had an opportunity to travel throughout most of the Philippines. Uh, I spent time in Manila, uh, Santa Cruz Laguna. Uh, I was down as far as uh, Cebu. Um, I was on Leyte where MacArthur made his famous return. Um, I spent all, I, then I was able to go on Bacolod and, and, and well, it's around different places in the Visayas. And uh, then I spent a little, little uh, more time up in uh, northern Philippines on Luzon, uh, as far north as Luwag and, and in the mountains of Baguio. Well, that gives us a flavor, I guess, of what missionaries do. You're obviously not working in just one location, but to explain um, your mission, if you will, what it is exactly that uh, you're supposed to be doing. Well, we have, uh, uh, we proselyte. We try to teach people to uh, uh, the importance of, of Jesus Christ in the scriptures. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's primarily what we do. We, we have... Uh, we also work with health missionaries and work with trying to make sure that we have uh, people learn about hygiene and so forth. Mm -hmm. So those were, those were parts of the, some of the things that we did. Uh, well, our experience, our understanding as Americans is it's pretty much door-to-door -door kind of a, a it is. exercise. It's door-to-door. -door. The Filipinos uh, I found to be uh, very hospitable people, uh, just a very wonderful people. Um, they. Uh, in fact, I only had one door slammed on my, in, in, in my face, and that was by an American. So uh, that was interesting. So most of the Filipinos, they may not want to talk to you, but they'll, but they'll be hospitable. Were they generally receptive, or did they hear you out and what you were trying to Oh, explain? many of them did, sure. Yeah. And how successful do you think you were? Well, you know, um, success can be... Uh, I guess weighed a lot of different ways. I, you know, I feel like uh, I had a successful mission. We, um, how do you weigh it? Well, made a lot of friends. We brought a lot of people to at least a, a knowledge that of the importance of Jesus Christ and and um, and their uh, uh, the importance of of living a standard of life which would be uh, following the teachings of Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, Were most of the people you are working with and proselytizing to uh, uh, Christians? Uh, many of them were. Um, many of them were, were already Christian, but probably the biggest majority of them uh, really didn't live their religion very closely or didn't follow their religion very closely. Now, I know there are certain element, portions of uh, the Philippines that's also Muslim. Yes, that's southern Philippines down in Mindanao area. And did you... Uh, do any mission work in those neighborhoods? I, I did not get down to the Mindanao, although I had some several friends that did. Okay, so there were people who were working with Muslim communities. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what struck you most about your time there? Probably the, uh, um, I would say, the friendliness of the people. I would say how happy they were in many respects without necessarily having huge amounts of money. Uh, money isn't necessarily the, the key to happiness. Um, they, um, I, I was struck by the fact that they, they were very uh, respectful of their elders. Um, and sometimes that doesn't happen here in, in, in America. And that was certainly we can, something we can learn from. Are there any especially memorable experiences you had during those two years? Oh, that goes on just you know probably the friends that, that I developed in the uh, some some of the areas in the in the province areas in, in Cebu and some of the landscapes were just just uh, incredibly beautiful uh, would you say that experience those two years changed you I would say it uh, helped me in many ways to firm up my own beliefs uh, even more okay mm -hmm. Uh, and you said that was 1971, 72? It was actually uh, 
started in January of 72 and went through uh, the end of December of 74. So it was almost an entire full two, two full years. Just, uh, just missed it by a couple weeks. Okay. What happens after that? Well, I came home and got involved in the horse industry and uh, home to Kentucky. Uh, we I, actually, well, I was. Uh, that's a good question. My when I was on my mission in the Philippines, my parents moved to Illinois, and um, he took my dad took other responsibilities in Illinois, and so I actually came home to not my home. I came home to the state of Illinois. And we had expanded the horse business while I was gone, and we got quite involved in that. And was your father still doing psychiatry as well? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Where where exactly was the farm? It w well, the original one in Illinois was in Champaign, actually on South Prospect in Champaign. Wow. And it's now that's now all subdivision. But so. very close to the University of Illinois. Yeah. Yeah, it was very close. Is that where you went to school? No, I uh, went to Parkland for a while. And, um, and then uh, I was in Champaign for just a couple years, and then I went out to BYU in Provo, Utah. Okay. Your major? I majored in animal science. Um, and as, as a matter of fact, uh, probably the uh, animal science has helped to some degree with the fish, but not really very much. Um, and uh, so I, you know, the animal science, I really had more, um, more concern for horses at that time um, and so we that's I, I came back from uh, BYU I met I met my wife out there she was actually from Boston and we came back and we got highly involved in the horses from that from that point what's your wife's name my wife's name is Nancy and her maiden name Forrest Nancy Forrest mm -hmm. um, obviously horses was something you loved were the Still prospects do. good? Still do, yeah. The prospects at that time were, were, were very good. Um, we were into Arabian horses, and Arabian horses at that time were, were uh, increasing in, in value. Even the Wall Street Journal thought that they were one of the best investments you could, you could uh, invest in in the late 70s and the early 80s. And so we became quite involved in it. What made Arabian horses such a good investment? Probably there was some mystique to it, uh, limited supply at, uh, earlier on, and um, uh, there was a lot of people with uh, big money that got involved, um, and that's, it became a trend, I guess. Okay. But when we had talked earlier, you mentioned that something happened in terms of uh, American tax law that changed the industry. Well, it did, and, and uh, the tax law changed so that some of the some of the tax advantages weren't there uh, for breeding horses. And so, most of the people that were heavily involved in breeding horses, uh, unless they had huge resources, um, ended up having to sell their businesses. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about how the tax law changed and the impact? Well, it had to do with depreciation. Uh, there was just less depreciation. They, they wanted to have investors have more personal involvement with horses rather than just have it be an off-site type investment. Okay, I understand and depreciation of equipment and facilities. I'm trying to wrap my brain around depreciation of a horse. Well, animals can, breeding animals can be depreciated as well. They have a useful life just like a machine would have a useful life. And, uh, uh, and actually, the way the laws were written at that time, if you bought a horse uh, that was, say, a teenager, a 12 or a 13 or 14-year-old horse, you could depreciate an entire cost in a, in a very, very short period of time. And the way some of them were doing it is they would finance the horse over maybe 10 years, but they would depreciate over three years, so they were actually making money from the government over the first uh, couple of years. And so that's where that's where some of the things that were were taken from the horse uh, industry, and probably rightfully so. So when you came back out of uh, college, you had an animal science degree. You came back, helped your father breeding and raising we, these horses. Right, we were breeding and raising and training uh, Arabian horses. What it, scale? How many horses? Were uh, we had we were up to over a hundred horses. We had stallions that were nationally recognized. Uh, we eventually moved to a place in, 
in McLean County, um, northern McLean County, uh, and had our uh, had our farm there. Um, and when the uh, I call it the crash because really it happened within just a matter of months uh, when after the tax laws um, were actually talked about. In fact, what's interesting is the tax laws themselves hadn't even changed yet, but Congress said this is what we're going to do. Um, and uh, that just put a, uh, people weren't going to buy horses and so Arabian horses for investment any longer. In fact, what happened is uh, many of these horses that were uh, had been sold in early uh, 84, by the end of 84, weren't worth 10% of what they had originally been paid uh, paid for. So uh, okay, I'm curious now. How much were the horses, uh, was a good stallion sold for before the crash, and then how much afterwards? Well, probably uh, some of the really good stallions were were often selling well into the six figures. Some of them were even uh, uh, over a million dollars. Holy cow! And uh, there were uh, after after the crash, people were stuck with horses they couldn't get uh, fifty thousand for sometimes, and where they had spent well over two or three hundred thousand for them originally. I mean, it, you know, some of the, some of the differentials were even greater than that. It was just. One horse in the early part of '84 had sold for uh, over a million dollars at an auction in Kentucky, and uh, he uh, he couldn't even get a hundred thousand for him. Uh, and this was after. driven primarily because it was a good investment more than it was. The, the original thing was the there. Glamour. It was it was a good investment as far as taxes were concerned. There was a lot of appreciation with Arabian horses at that time because that was all stim. It was a, and part of. Partly, I would say, was a, was a, was a false market because of the enthusiasm and the fattishness of the whole uh, industry at the time. But the crash happens. What year was that? That was uh, '84. Okay. And what happens to the Hurston family then? Well, we we uh, stuck around for a while, but we we eventually. Uh, you know, trying to see what was going to happen with the horse industry, I took a job with a company called AgriCovers in '85, and AgriCovers um, was um, a company that made plastic covers for grain bins. And uh, and uh, where was the company located? And that was located in Gridley, uh, just south of Flanagan by 10 miles. Okay. And so we started working with uh, uh, grain, grain covers. We had the ability to work with plastics. And um, as we saw the grain, the, the government at that time was also, government can really change its things. Uh, they can, but the government had been subsidizing grain storage. And then that changed. And so we, we were in a position where we were, I mean, while we had made probably 30 or 40 grain bunkers and placed them throughout the United States all the way from the state of Washington. There were a number of them put in Washington, a number of them put in Colorado, several here in Illinois. We put some in, um, in Puerto Rico, um, in Haiti, and s some other places like that. Um, but as that industry changed because of the fact that the grain storage was not being subsidized, we started looking for other areas to to take our plastics technology, and with my fish background, I I uh, actually met an undergrad student named Mike Fridsko at Illinois State. How do you spell his last name? F R I N S K O. Uh, and Mike Fridsko is actually the one who started the Illinois State fish breeding program and he started it as an undergrad, pro, uh, undergrad started it as um, uh, just in one of the back hog buildings uh, using brick, uh, cinder block brick as the original tanks. Okay. And uh, I, I wanted to go back and ask some questions about the agri-covers business. Okay. Um, I got a lot of questions about that. First I'm trying to visualize this. You talked about grain bunkers. I know what a grain silo is. I see these huge piles of grain sitting along the side of the road sometimes now. Yeah. Uh, 
exactly what were these covers? What's a grain bunker? Sure, a grain bunker, what, what we did, and, and you will see these from time to time around yet. Um, um, what our technology is we used concrete sides and we'd go up about four feet. And then, and then we'd fill the grain, uh, fill that area full of grain till we had a cone type shape. Uh, it, we had an, uh, corn gets uh, um, a certain slope as it's piled in there and then after it, after we pile as much in there as we can then we would use a heavy duty PVC type cover and then we would put over the top of that and then we would seal it off and our original technology we used uh, CO2 to fill in uh, the uh, in that grain to to kill the pests and to preserve the grain. Now we, we, we did find that in the humid areas like in Illinois we needed to have air blowing on it and we found out the hard way a few times uh, we needed to have air blowing or sucking on that uh, at all times. So uh, that, that in, in the west we were able to do that successfully we're in the more arid areas but in the humid areas we had to keep the air going. How long could you store grain that way? Well in the west we were able to store grain for uh, several years never had a problem. Um, in the you know, more humid areas as long as we had the air blowing we were fine when we could store it for several years. Most of the time for most grain companies they would it was uh, something they would take and put all their overflow grain in and then as the overflow as they were they would put into that they would take out of that first um, as they were uh, moving to their other markets. Well you mentioned pests I would think that's an incredible challenge trying to keep mice and rats and other kinds of animals and we, we put the grain bunkers right, we, we would put a, uh, uh, an asphalt floor down first and then we would, uh, we would cover the uh, area where the, where the concrete walls were with, uh, with plastic uh, and then put the grain on top of that and, uh, and then uh, as long as it was swept up on the outside it, it was clean and it was very neat. Why was the government subsidizing this? I don't know. I, <laughs> um, I, there was a lot of grain at the time, uh, apparently, and so the okay. grain, um, I, I don't know all the reasons why okay. the government. Well, I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that. Do you know why they stopped subsidizing it? Um, I can't answer that either. <laughs> okay, okay. So but they stopped subsidizing. They did stop subsidizing the grain, right. Okay. And so we... We were trying to work actually more through looking at our out of the country sales of our grain bunkers, and that's why we ended up going to places like Haiti. Uh, and we were we were looking at some of the other places like in some of the some of the uh, former Soviet Union countries were that were very interested in some of our mm -hmm. technology. But after the subsidies stopped, it sounds like. Um the uh, agri-covers business wasn't near as lucrative anymore. No, it wasn't, and that's why we really started working on the aquaculture. Now, you've, you've expressed almost all of this as we. Was it you and others? Was well, it your family? I, at, I did not own agri-covers at first. Uh, it was owned by uh, a man from Australia um, by the name of Wandel Root, and uh, he started agri-covers, and, and then we... Uh, I say we, I mean, he and I worked together on it, and, and uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we started working to promote the, uh, the, uh, the aquaculture because it looked to be that that was a good potential market. And this is where your friend at uh, Illinois State came into the picture. Right, right. Uh, talk a little bit more about what he was working on. He was working on uh, uh, tilapia, and that was my first introduction to tilapia as a fish. Um, um, he was just working on uh, the ability to, to grow fish indoors. Um, in our northern climates, we have to do it indoors. Uh, and tilapia had a lot of advantages. It grows fast. It grows, it tastes good. It uh, endures uh, um, sometimes tough water conditions. Uh, and and uh, they, uh, 
They spawn on a regular basis, so they're easy to keep your supply going into your into your uh, aquaculture setup. Um, you know, regularly. Mm -hmm. We actually harvest here every every two weeks. We harvest our eggs, collect eggs every two weeks, and so we can harvest on that same schedule. Well, you're wearing a shirt with Aqua Ranch on there, and I assume that's a tilapia right underneath the, it the is. logo. It is. Yeah. Uh, native of where? It's originally native to Africa and Israel. It's sometimes called the Jesus fish. It's sometimes called St. Peter's fish. Um, it is. Um, um, it, it is a tropical fish, and so it does not do well when it freezes. Um, so it's uh, strictly a freshwater fish. Stick, yes, it, it can it can thrive in brackish water, but it is not a saltwater fish. Okay, and what size are they when you harvest them? We try to average about a pound and a half. Uh, we sometimes will go higher than that. The batch okay. we have in there to be harvested now averages almost 1.9 pounds. Um, that's that's ready to go. And so. But why was it that Dr. Frinsco, I think I'm pronouncing his name, or I hope I am. Mike Frinsco. Why was he so intrigued by this process, and, and, and tilapia especially? Well, he, he saw the same thing um, early that, uh, that many of us saw, and, and in fact, really, that the tilapia was a tremendous fish for indoor aquaculture. And, and, and now it's been proven here some 20-some-odd uh, years later that uh, tilapia is undoubtedly the ideal fish for, for indoor aquaculture. What was your relationship with Mike? Mike, we were friends, and, and he was a... Uh, uh, we, we got a lot of advice from him to start off with. I mean, he was a good resource, and he was a very giving person. When you say... You got a lot of advice from him when you started. What was it that you were in agri-covers? What happened then? Did you move to this new industry yourself? Well, we had to start figuring out how to make systems, uh, aquaculture systems. I had no idea how to make a large-scale one. I mean, I could deal with aquariums, but to make it mm -hmm. a, a, an indoor aquaculture system. So we started getting some ideas from him, and we also checked around with other universities. And it was interesting, when we first started checking around, we could ask the same question uh, to six universities and probably get six totally different answers. It was so off the wall how much information there wasn't out there in the middle 80s. And, uh, and that's changed a lot in, the, in that time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more uh, available information now. But, uh, so we actually started doing a lot of uh, research on filtration and uh, the nice thing about it is when, because we had the ability to make things with, with plastics, we could, uh, we, if we had an idea, we could make it, we could put it into use, and we could find out if it worked or if it didn't work within weeks. Um, and so some of our technology, we, we actually had quite an accelerated rate of uh, finding if, out if things worked or not. The entrepreneurial spirit. It, yeah, and sometimes it's forced by, we got to get something sold. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, and I guess that's what I keep drawing, coming back to here, You've got this business, your partnership in AgriCovers. Um, it's not doing great because of the change in uh, subsidy, tax mm -hmm. law, and things like that. Then what inspired you to go this, partic this other direction? Um, you mean with the, uh, the aquaponics? With the aquaponics. Well, I started doing some research. Um, we, we eventually... Uh, AgriCovers, let me go back and just, AgriCovers was eventually purchased by Gary Ringer from, from Gridley. And he bought the building we were in and, and, uh, and, and we, I continued to function under Ringer Foods, the aquaculture t division, and continued to sell liners, continued to sell equipment, continued to work on research and development. And um, uh, in 92 we started I started actually working on aquaponics, um, and uh, and it originally started when uh, a friend had brought a philodendron out and was going to throw it away, and I looked at it and it wasn't quite dead, and I thought I wonder, and I just kept thinking I wonder, so I grabbed that out of the garbage, it was on a hanging basket, and I took it to our fish room, 
and I hung it up in the fish room and I started just putting fish water through it and letting it drip down to the plants or back to the fish and and within a within probably six weeks that philodendron just about took the greenhouse or the fish house over it just came back and people had to come back and take tours of the fish and see how we were growing it and they'd see that philodendron and they thought it was the most wonderful philodendron so they wanted to take pickings off it because they thought it was something special and it wasn't that it was a special genetically it was it was the nutrients were just there and so we uh, we started working on a number of different uh, designs to see what we could do t and how we could grow um, how we could grow plants more more efficiently and that's where the relationship with Mike and and talking to other people well who at are that, that at side. that point Mike had gotten a, a job in North Carolina okay and he's ac actually a, an extension advisor out there um, at that point we just worked with different uh, people from uh, uh, we worked at S with SIU um, uh, Dan Seelock at SIU uh, we worked with uh, Illinois State um, um, there was uh, Pat Foley at Illinois State and Denny Engel at Illinois State and, uh, and worked with them and, uh, and exchanged ideas. Mm -hmm. And we uh, made equipment for Illinois State as well as, as uh, exchanged ideas. And sometimes I got my fish from them. Um, so that's kind of that's where that went. Explain the difference between hydroponics and aquaponics. That's a really good question. Hy hydroponics is good technology, but it, it, it uses uh, a sterile water solution and chemicals to feed the plants. Um, in aquaponics, we cannot have a sterile solution. Uh, in aquaponics, we're using the fish water and realize with, with, with fish, you've got to have a colony of beneficial bacteria that support the fish in breaking down the ammonia to nitrites and then to nitrates. And, and that's, there's a colony of bacteria that's there. That's very, sim that's very similar and in many cases this exact same bacteria that, uh, that functions in the soil, only it's a lot faster in the water. And um, so when we, um, we've got to have that, oh, incidentally it breaks the the ammonia from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Nitrate is one of the most available forms of nitrogen to plants. And uh, when we have farmers literally putting on nitrogen, uh, ammonia, anhydrous ammonia at huge rates, literally tons and tons and tons per farm, um, we deal in parts per million. We, we have our water here that's about 200 parts per million. And so if, if you have nitrogen in a very available form, like it is in the aquaculture water, you don't need much of it. And, uh, and that's really the whole basis of this, is that we, the nutrients are very available. Uh, we do have uh, high uh, uh, microbial content, so the design has to be different than hydroponics. It can't be the same design. And, uh, because with a bacteria colony, it clogs up the little tiny, fine uh, plumbing of a hydroponics unit. And so um, it does have to be a little bit different design. And tell me then a little bit of the differences between what you have with aquaponics and these huge fish ponds that they have in the south predominantly. Well, the huge fish ponds, uh, that's, that's a good thing to clear up. That's really good because the huge fish ponds, uh, most of them are called levee ponds because uh, they build the sides up and they're about anywhere from four to six, sometimes seven or eight feet deep. And the fish will live in their own excrement uh, during their entire life. And they try to get some bio uh, action going the same as we do, but their excrement, that, that pond has to literally digest all of it. They have no way to efficiently get that excrement out. And um, what we do is we take and run the water th from the fish through a filtration. It goes through a degasser and then it goes through the roots. It passes through the roots of the plants and the roots of the plants acts as a filter system for the, 
for the uh, fish water. And uh, um, so that literally cleans up the water for the fish. So we don't have very much water that goes out into the environment. Very, very little. Uh, at the most, in the winter time, we might have 1% per week. Now, on a, in an indoor recirculating system in the, uh, um, anywhere that could be in the Midwest, it might lose as much as 20 to 25% of their water every day. Um, and that water, then the environment has to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's just basically like a, a sewer system, and that goes just dumped right into the, uh, into the environment. In some of the western areas where they're doing trout and some of the other fish like that, they have uh, water they'll, be, they'll locate right on a stream. They'll bring the water off. Uh, they'll divert the water through their, from the stream to their uh, raceways, and they'll go from the raceways right back to the stream. And so they, it's just basically like a, I guess if you had it in, in a cattle lot, it would be like a feedlot being located on a stream. And so all that manure is then put right into the stream and then that, then that stream then has to deal with that. What we're doing is cleaning up the water and reusing it. And that's the, that's the big difference in aqu aquaponics is that we're, aqu we're aquaculture, we're hydroponics, but we're not putting a load on the environment. We, we are, we are uh, conserving the water, and this is, uh, this is a technology, because of the water conservation, this is a technology that can go in desert areas and use very minimal amounts of water in comparison to some other agriculture. We use um, probably about 2% of the water that ag other agricultural areas use. Well, what you've described is a very symbiotic relationship between the plants and the animals in this respect. I guess the next question is, do you uh, have the plants to allow you to grow the fish, or do you have the fish to allow you to grow the plants? Yes. <laughs> it's, we, we, uh, we can't really have the fish growing at the rate we have growing without the plants. They are, actually, they are literally part of our filtration system. But yet we're able to grow um, good, uh, healthy plants uh, and be organic certified in the process uh, and the plants we grow uh, such as lettuce, basil or pr two big ones that we grow. Uh, we also grow tomatoes and peppers in here. Uh, what we're finding is that a hydroponic tomato for most people believe that has kind of a little bit of an, a bland flavor. Um, versus a garden tomato. Uh, most everybody will pick a garden tomato over a hydroponic tomato in flavor, in terms of flavor. What we find is when we grow with the high microbes in the water inside, we have a garden taste to our tomatoes. And they, they, they um, are very sweet, nice taste. And that's, we found that out even from taking to, it, taking to farmers markets. The farmers market people will, will come back to us specifically for our tomatoes over the mm -hmm. hydroponic tomatoes. Let's talk about the market for both of the products you have then. Um, what are the challenges with the tilapia? Who are your competitors and where is the market? Our, our, actually our biggest competitors um, are really China, Asia, some of those areas offshore. Uh, they uh, um, they deal with low price and they don't really um, there's a lot of in fact I've I've got uh, an article here that talks about some of the problems in fact I'd like to read it just to, if, sure. if, I, if I may is that New York Times article that New York Times article and it's what's interesting is 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 uh, some of the conditions that they grow their fish under this is a Dr. Ming Hung Wong from Professor of Biology at the Hong Kong Baptist University. He says there are heavy metals, mercury, flame retardants in fish samples we've tested. That's right in the flesh of the fish. He said we've got to stop the pollutants entering the food system. So they, they know it's there and that's not, probably 90% of what's being eaten in the United States in terms of tilapia come from Asia. Um, 
And he also indicates that, the, that more than half of the rivers in China are too polluted to serve as a source for drinking water. Um, and, and he also admits that water is the biggest problem for China. Um, another article um, talks about the fact that the toxins right in the fish have sickened people in 28 states. Uh, and these things are coming out. Um, I probably see some article about uh, polluted fish uh, entering the marketplace probably at least twice a month. There's some kind of an article that hits somewhere in the United States. But there's obviously some kind of a profit involved here with the Chinese. Is it because of the scale of the operation? Low price. They can bring it in. They have huge, they have huge uh, um, farms. Uh, the polluted conditions are, are very prevalent and the tilapia seem to be able to survive in that and they can, they can sell their fillets for cheaper than what I can sell a whole fish for. Now that's, that's uh, what, how's the labor going on that? Well, it certainly wouldn't be a fair wage. Um, the polluted conditions, unfortunately, when, when we talk about the polluted conditions, too many of our public are looking at price not quality. And, and so uh, we really have to put quality up as our competitive edge because we can't compete on price. So we, d I mean, you can literally see the difference in the texture, in the color, in the, and, and when you taste the fish, you can tell a big difference in the taste and flavor. So from your perspective, the quality isn't just that the fish has contaminants in it that's coming from from overseas but that there's a better taste and a texture and a color as well oh absolutely mm -hmm. okay wait when you fry up our tilapia in the kitchen it doesn't even smell like there's been fish cooked um, um, you know some of the other fish that some of the other tilapia that come in from some of the other countries when you fry it up it smells fishy and what is your market then our market is more the people who are concerned about the quality of food, who are willing to pay more for a high quality so food. Organic food. Organic foods. type, natural food type buyers. And is your target area primarily the Chicago suburbs and we, Chicago itself? We are, that is one of our big targets, yes. Uh, and, and we're starting to educate more people downstate and there's a lot more people that are starting. We're, we're into some of the natural type food stores in uh, Peoria and in Bloomington. Um, a farmer's market um, in Bloomington, um, it's been kind of fun as we've introduced it there because I can take 40 or 50 pounds of fillets in little half pound packages and uh, in three hours they're sold. Uh, three to four hours, they're gone. And uh, people will come back uh, with their little freezer cases and they want more fish the next week. So the market's there. The market is there. Um, it's, it's an important market, um, but just from the standpoint of just literally quality. And unfortunately, uh, there's too many people that will go to a big back store and look for cheap. And cheap is not necessarily mm -hmm. good for you. Uh, how many other places around the state or in the country even are practicing aquaponics like you've described it? I, there's probably hundreds of small operations. Um, there, uh, when I say small, I c we would be probably the largest in the United States um, as far as a commercial system. Um, <clears throat> when I say small, most of the ones that are out there would be like a 500 gallon tank um, where we have 12, 1200 gallon tanks and we're looking to add more. Um, so, um, but from what you've described, Miles, there's an incredible opportunity, <coughs> potential for growth here. Yeah, there is. There, there is a, a tremendous opportunity for growth. It does have to come through education. <coughs> it has to come through the fact that we need to make sure that people know that, that it is a healthier thing. It's just like beef. Beef coming from a feedlot is, uh, the omega-6s are very high. The omega-3s are very low. But if you have grass-fed beef, the omega-3s are very high, which are, omega-3s are the good ones. 
the omega-6s are very low. Mm -hmm. And so when you have uh, beef that are, that are injected with hormones you, and they're injected with uh, um, um, all kinds of you know, growth stimulants, they have uh, antibiotics in the feed, they have uh, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's not as healthy for you. Uh, um, and that's the same with us. We don't do the hormonal manipulation. We, and, and, and they actually, there's a, there's a process that other breeders do, other uh, people that are spawning the fish, where they do a har hormonal sex reversal of the fish. And they feed methyl testosterone to the fish and they change the females to male, and it helps them grow faster. There's growth hormones often injected, and then there's uh, antibiotics put in the feed. There's a number of different things done, and, and that's then in our food supply. And what, what does that do? The problem is many of these things that are being done really have never been tested in the long term. And, and things like cancer is never going to show up on a short term. And so short-term tests for things like, for some of these uh, things to really promote fast growth, a short-term test is not adequate. I'm picking up with some of the missionary zeal, almost like you were back in the days in the <laughs> Philippines talking about this. Uh, and you've sold me. So let's go back and talk about building this business, the, the, the business side of what you have here in this venture. When did you actually get to this location? We, we, uh, I, I actually made a deal with Gary Ringer in, in uh, 2003 and bought the business, the, the, the division, uh, from Gary and, in to, and then started looking for a place. The division, what do you mean by the division? Well, we had the aquaculture division of Ringer Foods. Okay. And we were in Gridley. And so I started looking high and low for the right piece of property, for the right building to to uh, build our equipment, to have our greenhouse, and it's all, you know, something that I just had envisioned, a dream that I wanted to pursue. Uh, I was also training horses full time, um, but it is something I wanted to uh, pursue, and so I, I, um, um, I started to uh, look for property. I found this property, um, made a deal in 2004. We started construction. Uh, we, the, the uh, the Morton building over here just was an empty shell and so we sprayed insulation we started doing the building and that's where we do our spawning in that building. What and was the Morton facility before? It was just a storage uh, building. They, they just had uh, building, they just had equipment stored in it. And Morton was doing what with the building? I'm, I, I'm sorry, Morton was, is the brand name. It okay. was just a Morton, uh, oh, okay. just the a Morton pole building. building. Yep. Yep. And so it was. It, it had been used as a seed corn company uh, previous to that, but but uh, it was a good opportunity, for, a good place for us to be able to do our equipment, our build our liners, build our filtration systems. You've got this brand new idea. You go to bankers, I assume. You had to get financing, financing someplace. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, that's uh, certainly important. Um, um, we. Uh, the president of Flanagan Bank uh, was uh, was open to new ideas, and uh, he's he's been very helpful all the way through. Um, he's uh, and yeah, we had to we had to certainly have his cooperation. Certainly, uh, we started. Uh, uh, we we did have some uh, some of our loans through uh, some of the Illinois programs, uh, which has been important as well. Um, but anyway, we started building the greenhouse here and, uh, um, in 2004 and we finished it uh, toward the end. Um, we did all, all the construction ourselves. So, I mean, you, you were out here actually? We were actually digging holes and, and my son-in-law and daughter, uh, Rob Prickett and Katie Lynn, uh, my daughter, uh, was in charge of the construction. and. Uh, they they did a good job. What's and the uh, what's the prognosis in the future for you? I think. Well, we are hoping to uh, to uh, double the uh, production here on this location. We're also looking at the possibility of some ins ins expansion um, 
we have some folks interested in, in New Mexico, uh, doing some expansion into New Mexico, uh, as well as a larger expansion in somewhere close, and we, we have not located a, um, a, a site for that, but it, we do want it to be somewhere close to the Flanagan area. Okay. I guess we, I skipped over a discussion about the marketing of the, uh, the produce that's behind us here. Well, that's, uh, it's organic certified. We, cert we, we market at farmer's markets. Uh, and also, again, in, in Chicago. Um, and uh, the winter markets were good to us last year uh, in Chicago. Um, um, and we also, we, we market to Schnucks in Bloomington and Normal. We, we market to, uh, again, the, some of the natural food stores in the Bloomington and Peoria areas. Uh, and and uh, there are several stores in Chicago that ha also handle both the fish and the produce. I would think the Oriental markets in Chicago, which are substantial, would love the kind of produce you have here, both the fish and the plant. Well, the Oriental market wants the live fish, and we originally sold our fish to the Oriental markets as a live fish, and then we went through the, the HACCP certification, and so that we're HACCP certified, and so we're now processing the fish ourselves, and so we can actually get more for our fish if we, if we process them. It's okay. actually a better deal for us. Did you say HAFSA? HACCP. Th that's the hazard analysis and the hazard control okay. by the federal government. Which side of this business is the profit? Well, I think they're, they're, they're both there. Uh, it's, it comes from both sides. So it's uh, which side. There's probably a little more in the, in the plants. And uh, now, obviously, an entrepreneur like yourself is always optimistic, but what do you foresee in terms of the future for your business, for aquaponics, um, and for the changing palette of the American public, perhaps? Well, I, I foresee more people really looking at quality of, of their food. Uh, and, and you talked about the Asians earlier. It's interesting, the Asians will spend 30 to 40 percent of their, their annual income on food, where most the rest of the Americans will only spend, uh, um, you know, 10, 15 uh, percent. I, I foresee people wanting, being willing to spend more money on their food for a better quality of food, food that hasn't been sprayed with pesticides, that hasn't been sprayed with herbicides, um, you know, that doesn't have, uh, that's more environmentally friendly. Um, so that's, that's what I really perceive, and I think that's going to drive the market. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to spend this afternoon walking around your facility and seeing every single step, aspect of your business, from, uh, from still working with the plastics and things like that through the whole fish side of the operation and into the greenhouse as well. And I'm really looking forward to that. Great. Uh, do you have any final comments before we do that? Uh, no, I just hope we enjoy it this afternoon. It's, uh, it'll be fun to show you the kind of how we do things. We're, we'll go all the way from planting seeds to, we'll be taking the seeds of the plants into the pots, uh, all the way to the eggs of the fish into the hatching jar. So we hope we'll get that, get, allow you to see all of that. Let me ask you this one question then. Um, back in your college days, animal science, it seems like you've come quite a ways from there. Uh, could you ever have imagined this is where you would be uh, 20 or 30 years later? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, it's, yeah, quite a long ways from, from uh, you know, there, with animal science, it is interesting that, uh, and, and as I work with people to do aquaculture, I find that people who have somewhat of a animal husbandry background I find it easier for them to do aquaponics because of b realizing that, you know, the fish have to be fed every day, uh, just like an animal has to be fed every day, and it's not something you can walk away and be gone for two weeks and leave. It is something you, mm -hmm. it's, you're married to the business. It's, you're married to the fish. You, you have to, ha uh, it, it is something that's high demand in terms of time. It's almost like being a dairy farmer. Huh? Exactly, yep. But it does seem to me that Every step of your life, every experience you've had, you've managed to take advantage of and apply it to this business. Well, yeah, I've tried to do that. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, Miles, we'll look forward to this afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.